All right, now guys, this is uh, your last lecture uh, for the end of the year. We'll wrap up plate tectonics here and then uh, start reviewing for our final, which will be taken next week. Anyways, uh, plate tectonics, uh, we've been talking about this all year uh, with all the other topics that we've discussed, but know what plate tectonics are, know what a plate is, uh, and that this idea that we have these very large plates uh, that are moving slowly and changing in size. We're going to look at the different types of plate boundaries where they either move away from one another, toward, or past each other. And all of this was developed from uh, the ideas that continental drift and seafloor spreading. So we'll go ahead and take a look at those. So back a long, long time ago, well, actually not all that too long ago, uh, Alfred Wegener noted that uh, the continents kind of looked like puzzle pieces that at one time uh, probably fit together. And he also uh, recognized that there were fossils uh, where these puzzle pieces would fit together uh, that are now separated by ocean that had the same fossils. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a lot of these things are uh, were land creatures. Uh, that we wouldn't find swimming across oceans like we do today. So uh, he came up with this idea that, well, these continents must have been together at one time and that they're drifting and moving around uh, on planet Earth. Uh, this uh, idea of Pangaea supercontinent was also provo uh, proposed by Wegener. In your reading and notes, you should have looked at uh, and been able to differentiate between Laurasia and Gondwanaland. Uh, Laurasia was this northern uh, supercontinent, uh, which North America and Asia were included in, uh, minus India. And then Guandanaland were the, was a southern supercontinent, and that was South America, Africa, India, Antarctica, and Australia uh, that made up uh, that continent. So in the late Paleozoic, uh, we can see glacier, glaciation patterns that were evident uh, on these southern continents. Uh, and so if we go to Africa right now, uh, this isn't an area where you'd expect to find glaciers, uh, but there's definite evidence of glaciers uh, in those areas. We also have evidence of coal beds uh, in, uh, in Antarctica and places like that and the uh, uh, northern continents like places like Pennsylvania which aren't tropical uh, places where we would find the conditions that would eventually form coal beds. So we're, we have continents that are located in places that don't match up with the type of environment that they, they used to be in. Uh, so that's, that's more evidence. Uh, we also have uh, paleoclimates uh, and this suggested that polar, polar wandering as potential evidence for, for continental drift. Uh, and that's the apparent movement of, of the poles. And it can be explained in three different ways. And I suggest uh, you read more about this in the book. And, let me, and so this particular evidence can be explained in, in three different ways, basically, is that one, the continents stayed in place and the poles moved around. Uh, so that's an example of polar wandering. Uh, or the poles did not move and the continents moved around. Or our third option is that both of those things occurred. Oops. So there was a problem with this continental drift, though. Uh, there was some skepticism. Uh, land bridges could explain the distribution of land-dwelling reptiles on scattered continents. So at certain times, maybe there were these uh, natural bridges that allowed them to cross continents. Uh, winds or ocean currents could explain distribution of fossil plants on separate continents. Considering uh, polar wandering, uh, that could be explained by the moving of poles rather than the moving of continents, as we just talked about. And then uh, the, the big thing was is that Wegener's proposed mechanism wasn't accepted uh, by geologists and his idea was that the continents were just plowing through the ocean floor so that the the continents above the ocean were were separate and that they only moved and that they were just kind of plowing along 
Uh, but if that was the case, there should have been evidence uh, on the sea floor of these continents. Uh, think of a bulldozer plowing through uh, the oceanic crust. So uh, that was that was a big issue, and so he had a lot of lot of pieces to the puzzle, so to speak, but he couldn't explain how how it was moving, and so uh, that was that was a major problem. Okay, so after some time, there was uh, a resurgence of this uh, idea of continental drift. Uh, there was evidence from paleomagnetism, so ancient magnetism uh, and magnetic fields. And basically what happens is when a, uh, when a rock forms and minerals in that rock, as it cools uh, and reaches a certain point, those minerals are aligned in relationship to the magnetic pole. Uh, and oriented in relationship to where they formed uh, in regards to uh, the magnetic pole. And so based on their dip angles and uh, the direction, uh, the closer they are to the poles, the steeper those dip angles would be. Uh, we can tell a lot about where that rock formed. And so if we found a rock with a, a very steeply dipping uh, um, uh, um, orientation uh, that would have probably formed near a pole, but that's now for, uh, found closer to the equator. That that doesn't match match up. So apparent polar wander uh, curves for different continents suggest real movement relative to one another. Uh, as we we look at I don't know if you can see my mouse on this. Uh, I should have it's a pen. Uh, let me see. Hold on. Okay, I got my pointer back. Um, I forget where I was at, but uh, in in Permian rocks, every continent shows a different pole position, uh, which seems very unlikely. But if we reconstruct their locations uh, and form Pangaea, then they all those paths all match up. Uh, and are nearly identical. Uh, so there we have our evidence, and that kind of refutes that uh, the polar wandering, and whether it's the poles moving or the continents moving. So we continue with this, this revival uh, of these ideas, and we start fitting these continents together, and we look at the geology, and we start taking the ages, glacial striations, uh, so evidence of glaciers that moved across there, the different rock types, the structure, uh, and they're matching up on different continents. So when we put South America and Africa back together in Pangaea, we have the same rock types that are matching up uh, that are now separated by oceans. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, paleomagnetic data indicate the direction rate. We've already talked about that. Uh, and Pangaea split about 200 million years ago, but the continents have been in motion for much longer, so between 2 to 4 billion years. Uh, Let me start looking at seafloor spreading. Let me check how we are on time. I think we're okay for now. Uh, seafloor spreading, uh, that's the concept that the seafloor is moving like a conveyor belt away from the crest of the mid-ocean ridge. Remember that forms out uh, like in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, it's a divergent plate boundary, which we'll talk about. And then it disappears by plunging beneath another continent or island arc. And this was proposed by Harry Hess back in 1962, so not that long ago. I think I mentioned before that when my dad was in school, this was all very new and very uh, controversial, uh, these ideas. Uh, and Hess's driving force was that there was this deep mantle convection uh, and so remember what convection is, the rise of hot material and the, the sinking of cooler material. So think of a lava lamp. And this hot material, hot mantle rock, would rise. And that, that motion, that movement of the, the rock rising and then cooling and sinking uh, helped drive this motion. So notice uh, we've got that motion on either side of this, this, um, this mid-ocean ridge here. So again, the hot mantle rocks rise. Uh, we have decompression melting that occurs. Uh, so remember, as, as rocks rise, there's less pressure, so melting temperature decreases. Uh, 
circulation uh, pattern uh, diverges moving rock away from that ridge as we looked at on the last slide. Oceanic trenches, uh, that's where the rock is cool and become more dense, dense and the crust sinks beneath a continent or island arc and, and forms that oceanic trench. If we look at the actual age of the seafloor, it's much younger uh, than the continental rock. And uh, we'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, so a tectonic plate is composed of the lithosphere and the uh, upper portion, just a little bit of the mantle. And then that rides on the asthenosphere. I like to use ride and not float uh, because remember the mantle isn't liquid. So don't, don't think that these plates are actually floating on fluid rock. And so the lithosphere, uh, the thickness of it and the age of the seafloor increases with distance uh, from the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, and like I said, it rides on top of the asthenosphere. And then the, it interacts at different boundaries doing different things. So we'll look at each of these boundaries here in a second. You can also look at the marine magnetic anomalies on the bottom of the ocean. And so if we look at a mid-ocean ridge and we start mapping the magnetic uh, uh, anomalies, you get this kind of almost think of a barcode or UPC symbol uh, that they scan at the stores and it's matching on both sides. And so as this hot mantle rock rises and, and, uh, melts and forms new oceanic crust depending on the orientation of the poles uh, whether they're reversed or not uh, will will create a pattern and that pattern on either side of the ridge matches uh, and so it's symmetrical so we can use these uh, uh, reversals in uh, the earth's magnetic field to help not only map the bottom of the ocean floor, uh, but to also calculate and figure out how old that age, uh, the age of how old the ocean floor is by using uh, those same uh, magnetic uh, reversals uh, and patterns that we find on continents and, and calculating the age of those and matching them up with the ocean floor. So uh, again, this is more evidence for plate tectonics. Uh, in addition to calculating the age of, of the ocean floor and, and different geology. Okay, and I think I'm running out of time on this presentation, so I'm going to go ahead and stop that here, and we'll start with the next one here in a moment. All right, so how do we know that plates move? Well, we can rate... rate uh, can't talk. We can measure their rate of motion. And we can compare the known magnetic reversals from lava flows on land and that rate of plate motion equals the distance from the, the ridge divided by the age of the rocks. And so I believe in your lab you did uh, some things that are similar to this. So if we can find the age on land, we can compare it to that uh, <coughs> at the bottom of the ocean on the seafloor and calculate um, how much it's moved and how much it's and compare that to time. Uh, we can predict the seafloor age. Uh, it increases with distance from the mid-ocean ridge, which makes sense. And we have a symmetric age pattern that reflects the plate motion on either side of the ridge, away from the ridge. I lost my PowerPoint thingy. My there we go. laser pointer. There we go. Uh, another test, uh, fracture zones and transform faults on, at long mid-ocean ridges, uh, as we learned uh, last chapter. Uh, if you read through it and watched my lecture, uh, there's a lot of transform faults along there. Those fracture zones uh, that uh, are between the offset ridge crest and that relative motion along the fault as a result of the spreading of those, those ridges. And then we can measure plate motion directly 
Um, we can mo uh, measure it directly using satellites, razor, razors, radar and lasers, uh, GPS. Uh, with the technology that we have, we can be incredibly accurate and are able to measure that, that motion or movement. Okay, so a divergent plate boundary. Uh, if we were in class, I'd show you the dance moves. I think I showed them to you at the beginning of the year. Uh, use those hand motions to help you remember uh, what direction these plates are moving. So divergent boundaries uh, are moving away from one another. Again, they uh, generally occur out in the middle of oceans, uh, but they can occur within a continent. So we can go to the East African Rift Valley, uh, which is happening on a continent uh, currently as we speak. Uh, it's marked by rifting, basaltic volcanism, and eventually ridge uplift. And eventually there will be a new ocean basin formed uh, in that rift valley. A transform, fault, uh, transform plate boundary. Uh, these slide horizontally past one another, just like in a transform fault. Uh, you can have two offset segments of the mid-ocean ridge. Uh, <clears throat> mid-ocean ridge in a trench, or two trenches. And these transform offsets of mid-ocean ridges allow for a series of straight line segments to approximate the curved boundaries required by the spheroidal Earth. In the last lecture, that's what I was trying to explain. Uh, I think I was using the example of paper around a ball or something along those lines. A convergent... Oh, and if we go back, uh, we should all know a really good example uh, that uh, the San Andreas Fault is a very well-known transform plate boundary. All right, so conversion plate boundaries. These are plates that move toward one another. Uh, so let me actually go back to this real quick. Uh, here, crust lithosphere is neither being created nor destroyed. And when we're talking destroyed, we're not talking about breaking up because if you go along the, the San Andreas Fault, there is definitely broken rock. Uh, we're talking about it melting and forming new rock when we're talking about uh, crust being destroyed. So at a divergent boundary, we have crust being created. Transform Fault, neither of those are happening. And that at a convergent boundary, um, a lot of times it's being destroyed. Uh, so anyways, an ocean-ocean plate conversion is where we have two oceanic plates coming together. It's marked by an ocean trench. Uh, it's going to be deep and we have a volcanic island arc. An oceanic continental plate convergence is where uh, it is very very similar except that it's not happening in the middle of the ocean. It's coming in contact with a uh, continental plate but we still have a volcanic arc. They're just not islands. It's happening on the continent, uh, forming a mountain belt. All right, but we still have a deep trench. And then continental continental plate convergence is where we have two mountain uh, two plates colliding together, both continental plates. So one isn't more dense than the other uh, necessarily and one doesn't end up subducting underneath the other. They both are forced upwards. Uh, so these two plates come together and collide and one decides not to go underneath the other. I guess they're stubborn plates maybe, uh, and one doesn't concede to the other. So a good example of that would be India and Asia. Okay, so plate boundaries uh, can move over time, and uh, mid-oceanic ridge crests can migrate toward or away from subduction zones or abruptly jump to new positions. Uh, convergent boundaries can migrate if subduction angle steepens or overlying plate has a trenchward motion of its own. Uh, so these aren't like fixed locations that uh, don't deviate at all. Transform boundaries uh, can shift as slivers of plate shear off also. So it's very dynamic over time. And remember, when we're talking about this, we're talking geologic time. So nothing or most things don't happen overnight. <clears throat> uh, plates can change over time, change size. Uh, the North American plate is increasing in size, the plate that we're on. Uh, there's new seafloor that's being added on the trailing edge of the Atlantic Sea uh, floor spreads. And most of the plate is not being subducted.
used to be subducted underneath where we're at in our location, but uh, right now just a little bit of the Juan de Fuca plate uh, in the United States, the northern United States is being subducted. So um, overall we're getting larger. The Nazca plate is getting smaller though. The leading edge is being subducted underneath South America and the trailing edge is adding seafloor but at a slower rate to what's being subducted. So the attractiveness of plate tectonics. Uh, it explains the distribution and composition of volcanoes, earthquakes, and mountain belts, and explains the major sea features of the sea floor. The reason we're learning about this at the end is we've, we've seen all the evidence throughout the year, and now this is, uh, and that helps explain plate tectonics, uh, but plate tectonics can also help explain why we have those things there at those locations. Um, so what causes the plate motion? So if we think back to Wagner and, and not being able to explain continental drift and what was going on, uh, now we have more of an explanation, uh, which uh, makes a heck of a lot more sense. So mid-oceanic ridges are hot and elevated, while trenches are cold and deep. Uh, those ridge crests have tensional, tensional cracks. The leading edges of some of the plates are subducting seafloor, while others are continents. Uh, so all those things that we just talked about and we have mantle convection that is um, is there to circulate and like we talked about earlier in the presentation helps drive those plates so uh, they may be the cause or an effect of of that circulation uh, which uh, went the wrong route but uh, we have ridge push and slab pull and i can't remember oh yeah i do have these other slides so ridge push is where a plate moves away from a divergent boundary. It cools, thickens, and kind of subsides. Uh, and so uh, think in at the Atlantic Ocean, we have that ridge push kind of pushing away from uh, that, that plate boundary. Slab pole is where we have cold lithosphere sinking at a steep angle uh, through the hot mantle, and it pulls the surface part of the plate away from the ridge crest. So as it's... Um, uh, pulling away it's, it's kind of the dragging the the rest of it away from that ridge crest and then trench suction if a plate uh, subducting plates falls into the mantle at a steep angle then their dip steeper than the dip then the trenches and the overlying plates are pulled horizontally seaward toward the subducting plate okay so as that plates being subducted underneath uh, the continent uh, or other plate uh, doesn't matter uh, it's pulling that seaward uh, plate uh, toward the subducting plate. Okay, mantle plumes and hot spots. So uh, a mantle plume is a column of hot mantle rock that rises through the mantle. It's stationary, it's not moving, it's the plates that are moving over top of it. And so uh, we can have large mantle plumes. They may spread out and tear apart the overlying plate forming a hot spot. And a good example would be Hawaii or Yellowstone. I know some of you have mentioned that you've been to Yellowstone and I think maybe Hawaii, I'm not sure. And Iceland, which happens to be a really popular destination as of late uh, to go visit. All amazing, beautiful places with lots of geology. And uh, in your lab, you had a chance to look at the Hawaiian Islands and see uh, how that hot spot, that mantle plume, is staying put and the plate is moving over top of it creating new islands and we can look at those islands and calculate the, um, the motion of the plate, the direction, and how quickly it's moving based on those different islands. Okay, they happen in the interior of the plate, not at the plate boundaries where we normally have a lot of this geologic activity. Uh, again, they can produce uh, volcanic chains. Um, the Hawaiian Islands uh, are, are a good example. And I'm trying to think of, well, Yellowstone. And if you look at the different flows uh, up in that area, uh, there's been different flows as the plate moves over top of that um, uh, hot spot. So I already talked about uh, rate and plate movement and uh, 
Yeah, so we can go ahead and move forward. So objections to plate tectonics. Uh, you can still find plenty of them out there. Uh, some seafloor objects do not seem compatible with a moving seafloor. Uh, the geology of many continental regions did not seem to fit the theory. So while some places match up, others did not so much. Uh, refinements of the theory made these features more compatible with the theory. So the evidence of plate tectonics is very convincing and this has changed the whole concept of Earth dynamics in the last 50 years. And again, remember, this is, this is still pretty new, uh, but it gives us a much better understanding. And it's a theory. Uh, it's not a law, so that doesn't mean that things can't change as we do, as we learn more about Earth and crust and, and develop new technologies to make more accurate measurements. We continue to understand this process a heck of a lot better. Uh, even in my time in geology, I've seen uh, some refinements that have taken place. And that wraps it up. So if you guys have any questions, let me know. And... We uh, will, like I said, hopefully be posting a review later today, tomorrow sometime. Uh, and we'll be taking our final next week. All right. See you guys.